Good morning. I'm Scott Litke. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Holocaust Education. Welcome to our monthly third Thursday Lunch and Learn. We're very excited today to have Suzanne Horwich from Artists Give Back, and uh, I'm very, very uh, honored to have her here today. Let me first do an, our introduction, and then we'll go from there. Um, as I said, Suzanne is the founder of Artists Give Back. She'll be presenting Inspiring Others to Give Back. Artists Give Back partners with organizations that are meeting the primary needs of refugees, such as food, shelter, and medicine. Suzanne has realized that often the secondary needs are overlooked, such as the emotional needs, the healing of heart in these refugee situations. She currently partners with various organizations in Poland and Greece, and it's growing where she's partnering. Suzanne has completed six trips to Krakow from her home in Colorado since the start of the Russian invasion to work with the Ukrainian refugees and recently just returned from Greece where she worked with displaced populations from Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and Africa. We thank you very much for being here. And uh, would you like me to start with the with the video, or was it? Would you like to start by well? I, I think I'd like to start with the video first. It gives people an idea of the work on the ground, and then we can go into what I do. Great. So just give me a moment to share the screen and the sound. Great. military places in our uh, town and uh, it was attacked and uh, a bit destroyed and also we are not far from Kiev but always people say that uh, Kiev can be attacked and so if we are close it's like 80 kilometers so can be any yeah. anything Scary. that's why they decided because it's very hard to stay there to uh, always to hear like um, air alert alarm alert, alert. yes and uh, then you can't understand like what it's real or no it's in, only in your head and all yeah. this you are waiting, you can sleep good, you need to be ready, maybe to run somewhere. And it's hard for kids also. 
scary for your children. Yes. Yeah, so. And do your, your your parents are here, or husband, Jenny, or just no, you and your daughter? No, just me and my daughter. My parents, uh, they stayed in my town. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to go. My sister also, because she has elder son and he's in army. So my sister decided to stay home. Okay. Just we decided to go. I'm sorry. For Save you. life. Mm. It's life. Mm. Mm. Thank you for telling your story. Thank you. What Suzanne is doing for the refugees and for us as Americans is so positive and so giving and full of love. Our experience here uh, is, it's hard to explain how beautiful and fulfilling and meaningful it is from giving art to going to dinner with refugees to going to the palace where they are living the whole the whole package is something not to be believed and certainly not to be missed good luck suzanne Wow. So I'm going to ask you questions and hopefully can get through it without crying. Yeah. Uh, every time I, every time I watch that, sometimes when I'm feeling a little discouraged, I'll watch that just to remind myself of the people that um, I'm helping. And I get a little emotional every time I see it. I can understand. So how did you begin doing this? So I think probably it's important to go back to a 10 year old Suzanne. I've really been digging deeply to figure out what drove me to do this work. And one of the first real powerful images I remember as a child, if you remember back in the eighties, the images of starving African children, the dehydration, the flies, the, 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 stomachs full of water. And I really think that these images affected me deeper than I ever really realized. When we move forward to uh, the Assad regime using chemical warfare on his own people starting in 2014, I remember, I remember thinking, why isn't anyone paying attention? Why is it not in the media? Why are people not talking about this? And I felt a sense of, of, of helplessness and really discouraged because really nobody was talking about what was going on in Syria. And I felt helpless. And when Russia invaded Ukraine, I woke up one morning before my foot even hit the ground I thought to myself, there's no reason to sit and feel helpless and discouraged. I can do something and I'm going to do something. And I reached out to professional contacts who put me in touch with JCC Krakow. I had only the intention of going to uh, bag food. That was it. And as I'm sending the email to JCC Krakow saying I want to bag food, I really call it divine intervention. I just had this thought briefly, quickly. Well, what are these refugees doing? Okay, they, they're having their primary needs met, food, housing, medicine. What are they doing? Because they're essentially, they're in a parking lot waiting. And they're away from their loved ones and they're away from their community. What about if I, as an artist, 
offered healing through the vehicle of art. And that's as much as I thought about it. I sent the idea, one paragraph, pitched it. Immediately, JCC Krakow said, come. And so I booked a ticket. And um, I, I have a very good friend, Ken Maxwell, who is also a mentor and artist. I called Ken and I said, this is my idea. What do you think? And we discussed for a long time about what this would look like. I decided to put in my own money to get there, to make this happen. Uh, I started a GoFundMe page and that was how the idea came. Um, like I said, two weeks later after the initial pitch, I was on the ground in Krakow with my little red suitcase full of art supplies, having an idea of what I was going to do. Also knowing you, I've never been to Poland. I don't speak Ukrainian, Russian, or Polish. Um, a little nervous about how this was going to unfold. Um, at the time, my contact on the ground had COVID. Um, so I knew that I was walking into a situation of refugees where I had zero experience, zero language skills, zero cultural knowledge. Um, and I just went for it. And that first day, I made my way uh, through hundreds of refugees waiting in line for food and uh, hygiene products. And I set myself up outside in the garden. So you have the lines of refugees. And I created what I call an invitation to play. To play. I base this on Rudolf Steiner, Steiner's Waldorf education, which I do with my own children. I set up everybody ready to paint. It's an invitation, come and sit. And I just sat down and I started painting and people are watching me and people are looking and I'm giving a little come over or a little eye contact. And before I knew it, my tables were full of, of, of Ukrainian refugees sitting. We're all sitting and creating art together. And we don't, you know, we don't speak the same language, but I always say art is an international language. It's like love. It's like music. When you are not using spoken word, you're, you're operating so deeply from a deeper place that I, I sometimes think the world should be silent for a week or two, because it's a totally different way of communicating. And it's a beautiful way of communicating. And day after day, I would go and more and more people would come. We developed relationships. Um, one story in particular, a grandmother named Vera, this woman would actually come every day and she would paint with me. And she noticed I wasn't eating lunch because I was busy. And this woman would stand in line for hours waiting to get me a sandwich. And these relationships just grew and grew. And I just realized the amount of dignity that was being returned, community. You know, I would have kids that would show up with their bottle of Fanta orange and cookies and I realized that it was their birthday and they had no one to celebrate it with. So we would get all of the refugee community to sit at the table um, and work together. I realized early on, I would say through the first two trips, that dignity was being returned, community was being built, but how could I now create hope? And I had this thought, why don't we work towards having art shows so that they can work towards something and then they can be proud to see it. And so I started doing this. I started getting someone to translate for me on a piece of paper. We're going to have an art show. Uh, you know, one of the themes that I did was the refugees drawing their interpretation of love. And we would work towards this every trip. 
And I'd get the most beautiful interpretations of love from hearts to fathers in the war, to pets lost, to houses missed, to the Ukrainian flag. And then we would have these art shows and the joy of the refugees to just have something, to have something um, to be proud of that was their own um, has really been remarkable and something I didn't, I, I never really thought about. Um, something else I've also implemented is, is gifting, um, gifting art supplies. You know, a lot of these refugees stay, but many of them go, a lot of them have gone back to Ukraine and a lot of them have made their way to Germany as Poland is very generous to the refugees, but they have cut a lot of the the aid, the free bus service, World Central Kitchen pulled out very quickly. Um, and it has been uh, a remarkable uh, uh, understanding of resilience in a crisis situation. It's interesting you just used the word resilience. We're working this week with uh, with the Omaha Symphony and a program they're doing and in, in us in ours we're we're talking about our survivor community and we're using that and the word resilience as a part of it I find it interesting that it, it's popping up here too are there are there general themes you're finding with all the refugees in in Poland that you've now been back a few times that you probably have some regulars but you also have new people each time are, are there some universal, uh, challenges, theme, themes that you're finding, or uh, do you see the art developing? A couple of things I've noticed. I mean, I really see these young boys from the age of 10 and up are really bearing the brunt and the burden of the war because their fathers are fighting, missing, deceased. That is something I notice what the young boys, they are really suffering an extraordinary amount of trauma. Um, I, again, I see a lot of resilience and I see a lot of great gratitude. I, especially with the mothers who are there alone, again, their husbands are not with them. Um, the mothers being so appreciative of just having the space to sit and let their children do something else. And the mothers being able to sit and just to catch their breaths. Um, it is, um, it's, it's, I just can't use the word resilience enough. I mean, we're talking about people who were professionals in Ukraine, who lived not lives, who traveled and, you know, they're now cleaning toilets to, to have the money to buy fruit and they still have a smile on their face. They're moving forward. Um, and they are very grateful just to be alive, no matter how difficult that is in another country. In the art that's being created, are, are you seeing any universal themes in that art or is it different in, each time? In the beginning with the art, it was a lot of the Ukrainian flag and a lot of the Ukrainian flag next to the Polish flag. That was early on. I see a lot, a lot of people like to paint their homes uh, a lot or the older women will paint messages. Maripool is Ukraine. You know, Maripool was the first city to fall in Ukraine. And that is a slogan that is used a lot or love brings victory, which you saw. But I would say I am seeing a lot of people drawing hearts and people drawing their homes. That would be, that would be, I would say it's evolved. I don't get so many of the Ukrainian flags anymore or the Polish flags, but something that they're missing or something that they hope that will return to them. What about colors? Are you seeing differences? I mean, as far as- Well, it's interesting because the little boys tend to draw military tanks and guns and ships in blacks and grays. And the women and the girls will always use bright, bright colors. And I guarantee there's almost always a rainbow somewhere in that drawing with a house or a heart or a pet. 
always. And are you are you working with some of the same families, refugees, or is it as you said there there there's there's movement? Happening? So it's a very fluid population in the beginning. So I've been six times. I go every eleven weeks, and I had the same refugee population for the first four trips. It is now changing. A lot of those refugees have decided to go back, and I am getting. Uh, in the past two trips, I noticed I have a lot of elderly because the elderly came and they stayed. Uh, I have a few familiar faces, um, but I would say that initial, those initial trips, those refugees have now left, um, but they do actually come back from Ukraine to see me. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. When yeah. you spoke here in Omaha, uh, last year you you talked about a couple of the the families people you've met could you share any of the stories some of the people who've had an effect on you some of the personal stories yeah. that I about, yeah. Scott? Yeah. sure so one comes to mind my fir very first day my very first trip i had a little boy about 10 years old named ivan and he sat with me all day, never said a word, never smiled, just painted with me all day. And after work, you know, the emotional toll is a lot. I'm upset. I'm trying to navigate a new city. I can't figure out the bus system. I'm feeling a bit lost. And I'm standing at the bus stop trying to figure out how to get to where I need to go. And the bus pulls up and there in the window, is Ivan and our eyes meet and we both light up. We point and he points. And it was just so beautiful because we're both strangers to this city. We're both lost. We're both confused. And he he says to me, this is tomorrow, by the way, when you don't speak the same, tomorrow we paint. And I said, yes, tomorrow we paint. And just to have that connection on the very first day because that wasn't random that I, I I needed to see him and he needed to see me and that is one of the stories that really sticks with me um I've spoken already about Vera the grandmother who um waits in line for food for me who knits gloves for me who knits socks for my children who sends me she's now back in Ukraine who sends me chocolates. Um, I became very close with a woman named Svitlana, whose husband lost his leg um, trying to save a comrade. Um, Svitlana was a policewoman and is now living in, um, well, she's now also returned to Ukraine, but living in accommodation, dormitory, university style accommodation with 40 other refugees, sharing a kitchen, sharing bathrooms. And, and um, I become very close with her and her children and just her appreciation for being alive and for the fact that her children don't have to wake up in terror to being bombed. Mm. And she was from Merupal, as I said, the first city to fall. So very, very traumatic um, for her young children who are six and 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 eight. Well, what have you learned about yourself over the course of from the time that you rolled out of bed and said, I got to do something to today? Well, I've learned that this was always in me. I just didn't know it. This is something um that I never foresaw but as I said as I dig deeper and deeper into why I do this work it was always there I just wasn't quite sure how to manifest it um I have a lot of love to give and I um feel that it is important in this world to operate through through love compassion and tolerance every day in any way that you can, because it completely shifts people's energies, the way they receive you, the way you are received. And 
I've learned to operate more in that in in my home, in my family, not just in Poland, not just in Greece. It's um, and it's also been overwhelming at times how to handle the emotional load of the work that I do. So I've had to really learn how to have some daily self practices to deal with the emotional load so I don't have the burnout and how I can go back every time and give the love and give that energy to this these populations that are suffering. And uh, when you were here, you spoke about your family and how how uh, how they've reacted to all of this. And uh, am I correct that your your children went with you on one of the trips? Yes. So, you know, the night before I left for Poland, I actually said to my husband and my children, do you guys think that I'm having some midlife crisis, some emotional breakdown? Do you guys think I'm crazy? Because it did seem a little crazy what I was doing, right? Jumping, jumping off the cliff. And my family has been so unbelievably supportive. My husband is a, has just really taken charge when I'm away. My, I have two young daughters, Samara, who's 12 and Gabriella, who's 15. And you know what? They're inspired. And I am excited that I am creating leaders and, and women who are going to make positive impact and change as they become adults. I have taken them uh, to Poland twice they are so well received by the refugees. Um, the partnership I had with the Holocaust Museum, the Galicia Museum in Krakow, they run an elderly program for elderly Ukrainian refugees. And these women were so happy to be around young, young people. I just, it was just magical to watch these grandmothers just embrace my children and my for my children to see it's important that my children see what the world looks like out of these you know four walls what's the general reaction been to what you're doing as far as you know, you've had the opportunity to present to speak to other people to grow artists give back how how is it all being received it's been it's it's been received really really positively Scott. I mean um I think people are inspired by what I do which is not actually something I thought of but I if I can inspire other people to have positive impact um in their lives okay um I I think people sometimes do think um uh, I'm a little crazy to just pick up and do this and leave my family. I get a little bit of that. Um, but, but overall, uh, I've been received so well and more NGOs, non-governmental organizations, um, around the world, um, want me to bring my program to them because the secondary needs of refugees are overlooked. You know, we need food to survive, but how, what feeds our heart? There's more to, you know, there's more to life than just food and shelter. Obviously these are the primary things that we need, but, but, um, it is often very overlooked in refugee world, just the day-to-day -day mental health of the refugees. So do you see your organization growing as far as right now it's it's you um I believe I mean, yeah. do you see do you yeah. see your, yourself bringing in other people uh we'll talk in a second that you're now into another uh, uh another country another group of refugees um I I do know. I do I I recently just took a nurse from UNMC and um, that's University of Nebraska, Nebraska Medical Center for those who don't know um, I, I am taking, uh, my next trip in January to Greece, um, a woman, Ann Zebowitz, who's a Durango woman who is in the Peace Corps. I am slowly beginning to look because now I have, 
uh, partnerships in Krakow, partnerships in Germany, and partnerships in Greece. So I am growing and I, I do have a family and there is a limit to how much um, I'm willing to be away from my own family. So yes, I would say probably a year down the road, I'd like to have a team that I can send to wherever they want to go. And when you think of secondary healing, I want people to think of artists giving back. That's the goal. And as an artist, would you, uh, I mean, do you see yourself working with different types of artists too? Like, I mean, like for example, uh, sending a sculptor or sending someone who works with metals or something like that. I mean, do you see- so differences in happening there and that may be a bizarre question but no no it's not originally that was my idea actually the idea was is that I would have other artists with their mediums but what I really realize is the refugees are it's about the art but it's also about the person who's administering the the the, the program it's a certain type of personality it doesn't just have to be an artist um and, the, you know, I keep thinking I have to come up with all these different creative uh, art projects. And really what I have found is the refugees are happy that we all just sit every time, day after day, and paint or do beadwork or knit. These are the three things that we do. And they're receptive to other to other mediums. But at this point, I really don't think it's necessary because we just have this you know, I would think that people would get bored of painting, but so far seven trips, no one is bored because it is about the community. Um, you know, and I, I implement things. We do cooperative, collaborative pieces. I'll bring in large canvases where we will all work as a community. I've implemented things like tissue paper flowers. So kids have something to take home the bracelets, but the painting hands down has just, you know, I have access to, to doing ceramic work um, uh, in my partnership in, in Greece, but, but a lot of it is, is, is the refugees are, you know, moving. And so I always want to make sure that whatever they make with me, they can take. And so I have these projects that they can always take with them. And that's that's really important to me, which is why I probably would not move into too many other uh, mediums um, because it's important. They make it, they take it. All right. And we were talking before, though, that you have quite a collection of... Well, this is what I was just going to say. So in the beginning... The refugees would make the artwork, they would take it. They would make it, they would take it. And something, when you talk about, have I seen things change uh, in Poland in particular, the refugees now always want to gift it to me. They absolutely refuse to keep it. Um, so I have hundreds and hundreds and hum hundreds, and you know, it's what they can give. It's a beautiful thing. They want to give me something because they are receiving. And um, it's really wonderful when someone sits at the table and spends all this time and they want a gift, you know, especially a young child. So on your logo, uh, it says, imagine, create, and then it says heal. And I'd like, how do you define heal in relationship to the people you're working with? Mm, how do I define heal? Well, let me let me let me first go back to imagine it. I think you imagine, you imagine the healing, you imagine what you want, you create it, and then the healing begins. That's really where that came from. So for me personally, I imagined it, I created it, and then I practiced the healing. Healing for me, Scott, is I'm gonna go back to being operating from your heart. That's where the healing begins, getting rid of all the noise and listening, tuning in to right here. That's, it's as simple as that really for me. So before we go to look at what you're doing now in Greece, how have you changed over all of your trips to, uh, to Krakow? 
Uh, well, I definitely am, um, have a lot more compassion in my life and I become a lot more tolerant, um, of people's just, you know, people, people have their struggles and people have their issues and, and, um, I become absolutely more tolerant of everybody is just making their way in this world, hopefully trying to do the best that they can. I do believe people try to do the best that they can. Um, and that's sort of a shifted perspective for me. And before again, we get into now you're in, you're in other areas. How did that, it, did people come to you or did you, I mean, obviously you've been finding out a lot about the refugee challenges throughout the world, but now you're in a whole, a whole other area. How'd that so in Krakow, yes, people were coming to me. I happened to watch a fiction based on truth movie called the, the, the swimmer. It's about, um, two, uh, Syrians. So, you know, we're coming full, full circle now back to my initial as a young woman being drawn to the Syrian refugee crisis about two women who were professional swimmers who make their way. So, so, so when you are fleeing Syria, Eritrea, Ethiopia, maybe it's easier to, to put in this perspective. You're basically going from California to New York on foot, and then you're taking an overcrowded life raft, um, trying to get into the first island of Lesbos, Greece, which sits right on the border with uh, Turkey, because then you're in the EU. And once you're there, you can apply. So I watched this documentary about these Syrian girls coming across um, from Syria, making it to Turkey, coming on the lifeboat. The lifeboats are not seaworthy, right? Um, the lifeboat sinking and these women swimming, true story, the rest of the boat all the way to Lesbos. So I'm watching this, this um, movie and the girls call their mother from a pay phone on the island of Lesbos. And they say to their mother, we're in Lesbos. And I thought, Lesbos, where's that? So I Google NGOs, Lesbos. I randomly pick one out of the list, just pick one. So Lesbos also ha has a refugee camp. So, you know, thousands of refugees living in squalor conditions and tents um, while they wait EU uh, asylum. And I reached out to an organization and um, that is how I started on my Greece journey that has unfolded very you're quickly. Going, you're going back there. You're, you're scheduled to go back there too. Yeah, this? I'm going, I'm going back uh, in January. I partnered with a, an organization um, originally who it wasn't such a good fit for me. Um, and so through, you know, once you're on the, gr on the ground in NGO world, you start to know all of these people. So I've now partnered with Europe Cares, which is a German-based organization, um, and Paraya Lesbos. So these organizations sit right outside the refugee camp in Lesbos that holds to capacity 2,000 people. They have 4,000 people. They have no shade. If you are not granted asylum when you come across on that boat, if you live, if you live, because most people don't, the Greek government is no longer providing food or water for you if they don't deem that you are asylum worthy. So Pariah Lesbos and Europe Cares has a camp right next to the refugee camp. And so every day you get all 4,000 refugees coming into Perea Lesbos. They can do laundry. They have, they can have, you know, coffee, food, water, um, IT training. It, it, it is all Muslim. Um, so we do have separate um, women and men's facilities. Um, but that is, uh, I just returned two weeks ago um, from working there and returning there uh, January 4th. And what are the similarities and I guess then differences too that you've seen between 
now working with a, with a different group of refugees? Well, I mean, honestly, this may be a little blunt, but that's what I am. Um, the actually the response to the work that I'm doing because people to tend to identify more with the white European refugees than they do with the black African right refugees. So I've noticed a real, real difference in how people respond to the work that I'm doing there. As far as culturally, um, I work with, in Greece, I work with primarily African men. And um, boy, are they dynamic and so enthusiastic to create um, uh, and, and, and fun. They play music from Ethiopia and Eritrea and dancing. And they call me mama, which is apparently a sign of, of respect in African culture. Um, you know, I think the difference is, is, is the Ukrainian refugees didn't have a choice. They had to leave. They were getting bombed. The, not that the African refugees have a choice because they're, they are fleeing something, but they have made this choice to make this journey. And now they are at the beginning of possibly becoming EU citizens. Now that is a long waiting game that can be absolutely brutal, um, but they are a little more hopeful because they wanted to leave their country, right? They wanted to leave. Um, so I think that's really what I'm seeing is a little bit, it's a little bit more joy in Greece with the refugee population. And this would probably be a good moment to show the short video you've created. So give me a second to share my screen again. Let me go to the first two. What would you like to tell us about? So I want to, in the second to the last image, you saw hands uh, in the shape of a heart. That is something that uh, I created with the refugees. We took, so the island of Lesbos is scattered with um, lifeboats and life jackets that are discarded when the refugees make their way over. So we took, um, we took the lifeboats, we disassembled them, and we cut out hands to create this heart. And this is something that I will continue to do as a fundraiser um, for uh, artists giving back Emperor Lesvos um, to make, to upcycle uh, these items that are littered. I mean, um, 
You have a lot of litter of, with the boats coming onto the island of Lesvos. Three weeks ago, imagine this, in 24 hours, 7,000 refugees hit the shores of Italy in 24 hours. This is what is happening in Greece and in Italy. So you can imagine the scale of lifeboats and life jackets. So I was trying to, to find a creative way that we could turn this into something. So before we open this up to questions from the group, what can we do? What would you like to see us do as a, as a community to, uh, to assist you? Well, Scott, you're doing it right now by, by allowing me to speak. So I'm very grateful. Thank you so much. You know, I'm just trying to get the word out. And I always say to people, if you can help me spread my message so that I can inspire others, as I said in the beginning, to give back globally, to give back locally, to give back in your own family, to be more patient with the waitress who's having a bad day, and you can cut her, give her a little grace, you know, to buy someone a coffee, to hold the door open for someone. This is, this is, this will grow. This will grow. If we can, if this is how, as a community helping, spreading the word, implementing it into our own, into our own lives. Well, I know on our end, we would love when you're ready to do a, uh, an exhibit, and then we can do some other programming too. But this, I, I just uh, am honored that you're here. I, I'm also the work that you're doing is just um, you're you're what we all want to be when we grow up. Oh, um, that's so you're gonna make me cry. That's so. Well, fun. you know, we we teach. Um, if you see something, say something, do something, and you you're the prime example of that. Rolling out of bed and saying, "I can't just sit here and and not do anything." Well, thank um, you for you're saying. Making Thank you. Very welcome. You're very welcome. Um, I'd like to see if there's any questions that anybody has. I'm going to put it back to gallery so I can see people. Um, if you have any questions, please take yourself off mute and feel free to ask the question. If you want to put it in chat, I always say I'm not really good at uh, chewing gum and reading or chewing gum and walking, but I'll do my best. Toba, you have a question. Please go ahead. So, um, Suzanne, I had the pleasure of meeting you when you were at the J last year, and it was unreal to watch what you were doing in the Ukraine. So now that, I mean, you know, obviously we're very focused on Israel at the moment. Um, I imagine that we will then also go back to being worried about what's happening in Ukraine. I don't know anybody who has done what you've done. And I assume you probably have kept in touch with people from the Ukraine. What is what is their life like now versus obviously when you were there so much earlier? Um, well, most of them have actually relocated to Lviv, which sits on the border of Ukraine and Poland. So not as much bombing, less. Um, uh, they're living their lives. They're they're li they're living their lives, and they're happy to be back in their country. And they hope that they won't get bombed. But most people um, are are in Lviv. They did not go back to their original um, original cities because it's too dangerous. And thank you for your kind words, Toba. Uh, Jesse, please go ahead. You can ask your question if you would. Yeah, hi, hi Dan. So hi. I'm uh, I'm Jesse Strauss, and I'm out in San Francisco. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. And thank you. Um, my daughter and I had the opportunity to meet with Suzanne at JCC Krakow when we were visiting. So it's really great to see you again. Um, I'm a social worker and a doctoral student at Penn working on the suppression of trauma stories and intergenerational trauma and forced migration. That's how I got connected to Suzanne. So my question is more around the mental health support. Um, I know at JCC Krakow, there was mental health support on the ground. And I'm wondering now that you've gone back 
I can't believe it's been what seven times. Do you see an overlapping in the kind of work you're doing in the healing? Like for me, I think it's incredible that you're providing this opportunity for people to paint their stories, so to speak, like to get the stories out. And I'm just wondering about the overlap for you with mental health. And so, you know, I, I just say, I'm just an artist and I'm just offering my, you know, my sure. <laughs> yeah. full of art, um, you know, Krakow and, um, uh, my partners in, um, Greece do have mental health, um, professionals. Yeah. And so you see it because, you know, I, I just have to back up and say, I'm working in the garden in Krakow last year in walks Jesse, who's a social worker and just um, really made my day um, by just reaffirming that I was doing good work, you know? Um, so thank you, Jesse. Um, yeah, I just, I just, I'm going with the flow, Jesse, doing the healing that I can give and um, the mental health support. Um, they do have a, a trauma specialist and all the facilities that I work in. Hmm. Great. Along, along those same lines, what about for the people like yourself who are are the uh, are are the uh, in charge? How how are they? How are you? How are they taking care of themselves so that they can give one hundred and fifty percent each time? Because the things you're seeing are and hearing about are horrific. They're horrific. Yes. Um, well, luckily we all, you know, I have a support system of other NGO aid work, humanitarian aid workers. Um, and that is really beneficial. I mean, I definitely see a therapist twice a month just to talk through, you know, not having the burnout. The first couple of trips to Krakow, I would go to my hotel room and just sob. And I realized this was not going to be sustainable for me unless I figured out very quickly how I can work through my own personal trauma of hearing the stories, rebuilding and going back out. So, you know, we all have therapists, we all support each other. We all on our days off, try to go to the beach or, do, you know, try to go to a museum with doing something together to support each other. Wonderful. I mean, that's, yeah, I, uh, I find that while I'm there, after I experience the trauma parts, I have to go walk for a couple of hours in order to get my head back on straight. Other questions? Sharon. Sharon. Hi, Suze. How are you? And how are you? Good. So I think it's so interesting that when you were in Ukraine, you had women and children, obviously, because the men we're back in Ukraine fighting. And now that in Greece, you say it's mostly men. Why is that? I think a lot of these, uh, well, first of all, there's a lot of unaccompanied minors. So age 14 mm -hmm. and up, they are the hope for their family. They're going to make their way and then they're going to bring okay. the family over. So um, I think that's why it's also a very, very difficult journey. You do get, um, you do get young children and women, you know, the refugees in Greece, they try anywhere from six to 33 times to make it. So either they're turned around by either Turkey or Greece they have an accident on the boat. You know, there are a lot of stories of boats going down, babies, women. So I, I think at this point, the reason it's men is because there have been so many deaths of women and small children um, that the, the men are now going to come and hopefully bring and just fit physically, you know, you, it, it's a very tough journey. I mean, you're hiking, you're being smuggled in trucks, you're on a boat, you're, it's yeah. difficult. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Of course. Other questions that group may have. Suzanne, this is absolutely amazing. I'm, we're honored to have you. I, I 
Can't wait to do something again with you. Um, your organization, Artists Give Back, the website is artistsgiveback.org. I encourage you all to follow. Susanna? Art, art, artists Giving Back. Giving artists Back, excuse giving me. Back. I, uh, and I, I want to say, some, I want to say something. You notice Please. I didn't name it "Artist Gives." I named it "Artist Giving Back." Why? Because I have received, and now I want to give back. I want to make that 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 point. So, if, you know, when you realize where you've received in your life, I want you to give back. Thank you. I can't. Uh, we'll we'll end with that. It was just beautiful. Thank you again. And uh, thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next month. Thank Have you. Have a great rest of the day. Bye. Bye. Bye.